A time came after the death of Joshua when the people of Israel asked God, Who will take the lead in going up against the Canaanites to fight them? And God said, Judah will go. I've given the land to him. The men of Judah said to those of their brother Simeon, Go up with us to our territory and we'll fight the Canaanites. Then we'll go with you to your territory. And Simeon went with them. So Judah went up. God gave them the Canaanites and the Perizzites. They defeated them at Bezek, ten military units. They caught up with my master Bezek there and fought him. They smashed the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My master Bezek ran, but they gave chase and caught him. They cut off his thumbs and big toes. My master Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off used to crawl under my table, scavenging. Now God has done to me what I did to them. They brought him to Jerusalem and he died there. The people of Judah attacked and captured Jerusalem, subduing the city by sword and then sending it up in flames. After that they had gone down to fight the Canaanites who were living in the hill country, the Negev, and the foothills. Judah had gone on to the Canaanites who lived in Hebron, Hebron used to be called Kiriath Arba, and brought Sheshai, Ahiman, and Talmai to their knees. From there they had marched against the population of Debir, Debir used to be called Kiriath Sepher. Caleb had said, Whoever attacks Kiriath Sepher and takes it, I'll give my daughter Aksa to him as his wife. Othniel son of Kenas, Caleb's brother, took it, so Caleb gave him his daughter Aksa as his wife. When she arrived she got him to ask for farmland from her father. As she dismounted from her donkey, Caleb asked her, What would you like? She said, Give me a marriage gift. You've given me desert land. Now give me pools of water. And he gave her the upper and the lower pools. The people of Hobab the Kenite, Moses' relative, went up with the people of Judah from the city of Palms to the wilderness of Judah at the descent of Arad. They settled down there with the Amalekites. The people of Judah went with their kin the Simonites and struck the Canaanites who lived in Zephath. They carried out the holy curse and named the city Cursed Town. But Judah didn't manage to capture Gaza, Ashkelon, and Ekron with their territories. God was certainly with Judah in that they took over the hill country. But they couldn't oust the people on the plain because they had iron chariots. They gave Hebron to Caleb, as Moses had directed. Caleb drove out the three sons of Anak. But the people of Benjamin couldn't get rid of the Jebusites living in Jerusalem. Benjaminites and Jebusites live side by side in Jerusalem to this day. The house of Joseph went up to attack Bethel. God was with them. Joseph sent out spies to look the place over. Bethel used to be known as Luz. The spies saw a man leaving the city and said to him, Show us a way into the city and we'll treat you well. The man showed them a way in. They killed everyone in the city but the man and his family. The man went to Hittite country and built a city. He named it Luz, that's its name to this day. But Manasseh never managed to drive out Beth Shan, Tanakh, Dor, Iblim, and Megiddo with their territories. The Canaanites dug in their heels and wouldn't budge. When Israel became stronger they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they never got rid of them. Neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. The Canaanites stuck it out and lived there with them. Nor did Zebulun drive out the Canaanites in Kitron or Nahalol. They kept living there, but they were put to forced labor. Nor did Asher drive out the people of Akko, Sidon, Olib, Aksib, Helba, Afek, 
and Rehob. Asher went ahead and settled down with the Canaanites since they could not get rid of them. Naphtali fared no better. They couldn't drive out the people of Beth Shemesh or Beth Anath so they just moved in and lived with them. They did, though, put them to forced labor. The Amorites pushed the people of Dan up into the hills and wouldn't let them down on the plains. The Amorites stubbornly continued to live in Mount Heres, Igelin, and Shalbim. But when the house of Joseph got the upper hand, they were put to forced labor. The Amorite border extended from Scorpions Pass and Selah upward. God's angel went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I brought you out of Egypt, I led you to the land that I promised to your fathers, and I said, I'll never break my covenant with you, never. And you're never to make a covenant with the people who live in this land. Tear down their altars. But you haven't obeyed me. What's this that you're doing? So now I'm telling you that I won't drive them out before you. They'll trip you up and their gods will become a trap. When God's angel had spoken these words to all the people of Israel, they cried out, Oh! How they wept! They named the place Bokim, Weepers. And there they sacrificed to God. After Joshua had dismissed them, the people of Israel went off to claim their allotted territories and take possession of the land. The people worshipped God throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the time of the leaders who survived him, leaders who had been in on all of God's great work that he had done for Israel. Then Joshua son of Nun, the servant of God, died. He was 110 years old. They buried him in his allotted inheritance at Timnath Heres in the hills of Ephraim north of Mount Gash. Eventually that entire generation died and was buried. Then another generation grew up that didn't know anything of God or the work he had done for Israel. The people of Israel did evil in God's sight, they served Baal gods, they deserted God, the God of their parents who had led them out of Egypt, they took up with other gods, gods of the peoples around them. They actually worshipped them. And oh, how they angered God as they worshipped God Baal and Goddess Astarte. God's anger was hot against Israel, he handed them off to plunderers who stripped them, he sold them cheap to enemies on all sides. They were helpless before their enemies. Every time they walked out the door God was with them, but for evil, just as God had said, just as he had sworn he would do. They were in a bad way. But then God raised up judges who saved them from their plunderers. But they wouldn't listen to their judges, they prostituted themselves to other gods, worshipped them. They lost no time leaving the road walked by their parents, the road of obedience to God's commands. They refused to have anything to do with it. When God was setting up judges for them, he would be right there with the judge, he would save them from their enemy's oppression as long as the judge was alive, for God was moved to compassion when he heard their groaning because of those who afflicted and beat them. But when the judge died, the people went right back to their old ways, but even worse than their parents, running after other gods, serving and worshipping them. Stubborn as mules, they didn't drop a single evil practice. And God's anger blazed against Israel. He said, Because these people have thrown out my covenant that I commanded their parents and haven't listened to me, I'm not driving out one more person from the nations that Joshua left behind when he died. I'll use them to test Israel and see whether they stay on God's road and walk down it as their parents did. That's why God let those nations remain. He didn't drive them out or let Joshua get rid of them. These are the nations that God left there, using them to test the Israelites who had no experience in the Canaanite wars. He did it to train the descendants of Israel, the ones who had no battle experience, 
in the art of war. He left the five Philistine tyrants, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians, and the Hivites living on Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon to Hamathus Pass. They were there to test Israel and see whether they would obey God's commands that were given to their parents through Moses. But the people of Israel made themselves at home among the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. They married their daughters and gave their own daughters to their sons in marriage. And they worshipped their gods. The people of Israel did evil in God's sight. They forgot their god and worshipped the Baal gods and Asherah goddesses. God's hot anger blazed against Israel. He sold them off to Cushan Rishathaim king of Aram Naharim. The people of Israel were in servitude to Cushan Rishathaim for eight years. The people of Israel cried out to God and God raised up a savior who rescued them, Caleb's nephew Othniel, son of his younger brother Kenas. The Spirit of God came on him and he rallied Israel. He went out to war and God gave him Cushan Rishathaim king of Aram Naharim. Othniel made short work of him. The land was quiet for forty years. Then Othniel son of Kenaz died. But the people of Israel went back to doing evil in God's sight. So God made Eglon king of Moab a power against Israel because they did evil in God's sight. He recruited the Ammonites and Amalekites and went out and struck Israel. They took the city of Palms. The people of Israel were in servitude to Eglon fourteen years. The people of Israel cried out to God and God raised up for them a savior, Ehud son of Gera, a Benjaminite. He was left-handed. The people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon king of Moab. Ehud made himself a short two-edged sword and strapped it on his right thigh under his clothes. He presented the tribute to Eglon king of Moab. Eglon was grossly fat. After Ehud finished presenting the tribute, he went a little way with the men who had carried it. But when he got as far as the stone images near Gilgal, he went back and said, I have a private message for you, O king. The king told his servants, Leave. They all left. Ehud approached him, the king was now quite alone in his cool rooftop room, and said, I have a word of God for you. Eglon stood up from his throne. Ehud reached with his left hand and took his sword from his right thigh and plunged it into the king's big belly. Not only the blade but the hilt went in. The fat closed in over it so he couldn't pull it out. Ehud slipped out by way of the porch and shut and locked the doors of the rooftop room behind him. Then he was gone when the servants came, they saw with surprise that the doors to the rooftop room were locked. They said, he's probably relieving himself in the restroom. They waited. And then they worried, no one was coming out of those locked doors. Finally, they got a key and unlocked them. There was their master, fallen on the floor, dead. While they were standing around wondering what to do, Ehud was long gone. He got past the stone images and escaped to Syra. When he got there, he sounded the trumpet on Mount Ephraim. The people of Israel came down from the hills and joined him. He took his place at their head. He said, Follow me, for God has given your enemies, yes, Moab, to you. They went down after him and secured the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites. They let no one cross over. At that time, they struck down about ten companies of Moabites, all of them well-fed and robust. Not one escaped. That day Moab was subdued under the hand of Israel, the land was quiet for eighty years. Shamgar son of Anath came after Ehud. Using a cattle prod, 
he killed 600 Philistines single-handed. He too saved Israel. The people of Israel kept right on doing evil in God's sight. With Ehud dead, God sold them off to Jabin king of Canaan who ruled from Hazer. Sisera, who lived in Harasheth Haggayim, was the commander of his army. The people of Israel cried out to God because he had cruelly oppressed them with his 900 iron chariots for 20 years. Deborah was a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth. She was judge over Israel at that time. She held court under Deborah's palm between Ramah and Bethel in the hills of Ephraim. The people of Israel went to her in matters of justice. She sent for Barak son of Abinoam from Kadesh in Naphtali and said to him, It has become clear that God, the God of Israel, commands you, Go to Mount Tabor and prepare for battle. Take ten companies of soldiers from Naphtali and Zebulun. I'll take care of getting Sisera, the leader of Jabin's army, to the Kishon River with all his chariots and troops. And I'll make sure you win the battle. Barak said, If you go with me, I'll go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. She said, Of course I'll go with you. But understand that with an attitude like that, there'll be no glory in it for you. God will use a woman's hand to take care of Sisera. Deborah got ready and went with Barak to Kadesh. Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali together at Kadesh. Ten companies of men followed him. And Deborah was with him. It happened that Heber the Kenite had parted company with the other Kenite, the descendants of Hobab, Moses' in-law. He was now living at Sananim Oak near Kadesh. They told Sisera that Barak son of Abinoam had gone up to Mount Tabor. Sisera immediately called up all his chariots to the Kishon River, 900 iron chariots, along with all his troops who were with him at Harasheth Haggayim. Deborah said to Barak, Charge! This very day God has given you victory over Sisera. Isn't God marching before you? Barak charged down the slopes of Mount Tabor, his ten companies following him. God routed Sisera, all those chariots, all those troops, before Barak. Sisera jumped out of his chariot and ran. Barak chased the chariots and troops all the way to Harasheth Haggayim. Sisera's entire fighting force was killed, not one man left. Meanwhile Sisera, running for his life, headed for the tent of Jael, wife of Heber the Kenite. Jabin king of Hazer and Heber the Kenite were on good terms with one another. Jael stepped out to meet Sisera and said, Come in, sir. Stay here with me. Don't be afraid. So he went with her into her tent. She covered him with a blanket. He said to her, Please, a little water. I'm thirsty. She opened a bottle of milk, gave him a drink, and then covered him up again. He then said, Stand at the tent flap. If anyone comes by and asks you, Is there anyone here, tell him, No, not a soul. Then while he was fast asleep from exhaustion, Jael wife of Heber took a tent peg and hammer, tiptoed toward him, and drove the tent peg through his temple and all the way into the ground. He convulsed and died. Barak arrived in pursuit of Sisera. Jael went out to greet him. She said, Come, I'll show you the man you're looking for. He went with her and there he was, Sisera, stretched out, dead, with a tent peg through his temple. On that day God subdued Jabin king of Canaan before the people of Israel. The people of Israel pressed harder and harder on Jabin king of Canaan until there was nothing left of him. That day Deborah and Barak son of Abinoam sang this song. When they let down their hair in Israel, they let it blow wild in the wind. 
the people volunteered with abandon. Bless God. Hear O kings. Listen O princes. To God, yes to God, I'll sing. Make music to God. To the God of Israel. God, when you left Seir. Marched across the fields of Edom. Earth quaked, yes, the skies poured rain. Oh, the clouds made rivers. Mountains leapt before God, the Sinai God. Before God, the God of Israel. In the time of Shamgar son of Anath. And in the time of Jael. Public roads were abandoned. Travelers went by back roads. Warriors became fat and sloppy. No fight left in them. Then you, Deborah, rose up. You got up, a mother in Israel. God chose new leaders. Who then fought at the gates. And not a shield or spear to be seen. Among the forty companies of Israel. Lift your hearts high, O Israel. With abandon, volunteering yourselves with the people, bless God. You who ride on prized donkeys. Comfortably mounted on blankets. And you who walk down the roads. Ponder, attend. Gather at the town well. And listen to them sing. Chanting the tale of God's victories. His victories accomplished in Israel then the people of God. Went down to the city gates. Wake up, wake up, Deborah. Wake up, wake up, sing a song. On your feet, Barak. Take your prisoners, son of Abinoam. Then the remnant went down to greet the brave ones. The people of God joined the mighty ones. The captains from Ephraim came to the valley. Behind you, Benjamin, with your troops. Captains marched down from Makir. From Zebulun high-ranking leaders came down. Issachar's princes rallied to Deborah. Issachar stood fast with Barak. Backing him up on the field of battle. But in Reuben's divisions there was much second-guessing. Why all those campfire discussions? Diverted and distracted. Reuben's divisions couldn't make up their minds. Gilead played it safe across the Jordan. And Dan, why did he go off sailing? Asher kept his distance on the seacoast. Safe and secure in his harbors. But Zebulun risked life and limb, defied death as did Naphtali on the battle heights. The kings came, they fought. The kings of Canaan fought. At Tanak they fought, at Megiddo's brook. But they took no silver, no plunder. The stars in the sky joined the fight. From their courses they fought against Sisera. The torrent Kishon swept them away. The torrent attacked them, the torrent kishon. Oh, you'll stomp on the necks of the strong. Then the hoofs of the horses pounded. Charging, stampeding stallions. Curse Meraz, says God's angel. Curse, double curse, its people. Because they didn't come when God needed them. Didn't rally to God's side with valiant fighters. Most blessed of all women is Jael, wife of Heber the Kenite. Most blessed of homemaking women. He asked for water. She brought milk. In a handsome bowl. She offered cream. She grabbed a tent peg in her left hand. With her right hand she seized a hammer. She hammered Sisera, she smashed his head. She drove a hole through his temple. He slumped at her feet. He fell. He sprawled. He slumped at her feet. He fell. Slumped. 
Fallen. Dead. Cicera's mother waited at the window. A weary, anxious watch. What's keeping his chariot? What delays his chariot's rumble? The wisest of her ladies in waiting answers. With calm, reassuring words. Don't you think they're busy at plunder? Dividing up the loot. A girl, maybe two girls. For each man. And for Cicera a bright silk shirt. A prize, fancy silk shirt. And a colorful scarf, make it two scarves. To grace the neck of the plunderer. Thus may all God's enemies perish. While his lovers be like the unclouded Sunday the land was quiet for forty years. Yet again the people of Israel went back to doing evil in God's sight. God put them under the domination of Midian for seven years. Midian overpowered Israel. Because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves hideouts in the mountains, caves and forts. When Israel planted its crops, Midian and Amalek, the Easterners, would invade them, camp in their fields, and destroy their crops all the way down to Gaza. They left nothing for them to live on, neither sheep nor ox nor donkey. Bringing their cattle and tents, they came in and took over, like an invasion of locusts. And their camels, past counting. They marched in and devastated the country. The people of Israel, reduced to grinding poverty by Midian, cried out to God for help. One time when the people of Israel had cried out to God because of Midian, God sent them a prophet with this message, God, the God of Israel, says I delivered you from Egypt. I freed you from a life of slavery. I rescued you from Egypt's brutality. And then from every oppressor. I pushed them out of your way. And gave you their land. And I said to you, I am God, your God. Don't for a minute be afraid of the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But you didn't listen to me. One day the angel of God came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Josh the Abiasrite, whose son Gideon was threshing wheat in the winepress, out of sight of the Midianites. The angel of God appeared to him and said, God is with you, O mighty warrior. Gideon replied, With me, my master. If God is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the miracle wonders our parents and grandparents told us about, telling us, didn't God deliver us from Egypt? The fact is, God has nothing to do with us, he has turned us over to Midian. But God faced him directly, go in this strength that is yours. Save Israel from Midian. Haven't I just sent you? Gideon said to him, me, my master. How and with what could I ever save Israel? Look at me. My clan's the weakest in Manasseh and I'm the runt of the litter. God said to him, I'll be with you. Believe me, you'll defeat Midian as one man. Gideon said, if you're serious about this, do me a favor, give me a sign to back up what you're telling me. Don't leave until I come back and bring you my gift. He said, I'll wait till you get back. Gideon went and prepared a young goat and a huge amount of unraised bread, he used over half a bushel of flour. He put the meat in a basket and the broth in a pot and took them back under the shade of the oak tree for a sacred meal. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and unraised bread, place them on that rock, and pour the broth on them. Gideon did it. The angel of God stretched out the tip of the stick he was holding and touched the meat and the bread. Fire broke out of the rock and burned up the meat and bread while the angel of God slipped away out of sight. And Gideon knew it was the angel of God, Gideon said, Oh no! 
Master, God. I have seen the angel of God face to face. But God reassured him, easy now. Don't panic. You won't die. Then Gideon built an altar there to God and named it, God's Peace. It's still called that at Afra of Abizar. That night this happened. God said to him, Take your father's best seven-year-old bull, the prime one. Tear down your father's ball altar and chop down the Asherah fertility pole beside it. Then build an altar to God, your God, on the top of this hill. Take the prime bull and present it as a whole burnt offering, using firewood from the Asherah pole that you cut down. Gideon selected ten men from his servants and did exactly what God had told him. But because of his family and the people in the neighborhood, he was afraid to do it openly, so he did it that night. Early in the morning, the people in town were shocked to find Baal's altar torn down, the Eshira pole beside it chopped down, and the prime bull burning away on the altar that had been built. They kept asking, who did this? Questions and more questions, and then the answer, Gideon son of Josh did it. The men of the town demanded of Josh, bring out your son. He must die. Why, he tore down the Baal altar and chopped down the Eshira tree. But Josh stood up to the crowd pressing in on him, are you going to fight Baal's battles for him? Are you going to save him? Anyone who takes Baal's side will be dead by morning. If Baal is a god in fact, let him fight his own battles and defend his own altar. They nicknamed Gideon that day Jeroboam because after he had torn down the Baal altar, he had said, let Baal fight his own battles. All the Midianites and Amalekites, the Easterners, got together, crossed the river, and made camp in the valley of Jezreel. God's Spirit came over Gideon. He blew his ram's horn trumpet and the Abiasrites came out, ready to follow him. He dispatched messengers all through Manasseh, calling them to the battle, also to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali. They all came. Gideon said to God, If this is right, if you are using me to save Israel as you've said, then look, I'm placing a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If dew is on the fleece only, but the floor is dry, then I know that you will use me to save Israel, as you said. That's what happened. When he got up early the next morning, he wrung out the fleece, enough dew to fill a bowl with water. Then Gideon said to God, Don't be impatient with me, but let me say one more thing. I want to try another time with the fleece. But this time let the fleece stay dry, while the dew drenches the ground. God made it happen that very night. Only the fleece was dry while the ground was wet with dew. Yet again the people of Israel went back to doing evil in God's sight. God put them under the domination of Midian for seven years. Midian overpowered Israel. Because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves hideouts in the mountains, caves and forts. When Israel planted its crops, Midian and Amalek, the Easterners, would invade them, camp in their fields, and destroy their crops all the way down to Gaza. They left nothing for them to live on, neither sheep nor ox nor donkey. Bringing their cattle and tents, they came in and took over, like an invasion of locusts. And their camels, past counting. They marched in and devastated the country. The people of Israel, reduced to grinding poverty by Midian, cried out to God for help. One time when the people of Israel had cried out to God because of Midian, God sent them a prophet with this message, God, the God of Israel, says I delivered you from Egypt. I freed you from a life of slavery. I rescued you from Egypt's brutality. And then from every oppressor. 
I pushed them out of your way. And gave you their land, and I said to you, I am God, your God. Don't for a minute be afraid of the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But you didn't listen to me. One day the angel of God came and sat down under the oak in offer that belonged to Josh the Abiasrite, whose son Gideon was threshing wheat in the winepress, out of sight of the Midianites. The angel of God appeared to him and said, God is with you, O mighty warrior. Gideon replied, With me, my master. If God is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the miracle wonders our parents and grandparents told us about, telling us, didn't God deliver us from Egypt? The fact is, God has nothing to do with us, he has turned us over to Midian. But God faced him directly, go in this strength that is yours. Save Israel from Midian. Haven't I just sent you? Gideon said to him, Me, my master. How and with what could I ever save Israel? Look at me. My clan's the weakest in Manasseh and I'm the runt of the litter. God said to him, I'll be with you. Believe me, you'll defeat Midian as one man. Gideon said, If you're serious about this, do me a favor, give me a sign to back up what you're telling me. Don't leave until I come back and bring you my gift. He said, I'll wait till you get back. Gideon went and prepared a young goat and a huge amount of unraised bread, he used over half a bushel of flour. He put the meat in a basket and the broth in a pot and took them back under the shade of the oak tree for a sacred meal. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and unraised bread, place them on that rock, and pour the broth on them. Gideon did it. The angel of God stretched out the tip of the stick he was holding and touched the meat and the bread. Fire broke out of the rock and burned up the meat and bread while the angel of God slipped away out of sight. And Gideon knew it was the angel of God, Gideon said, Oh no! Master, God! I have seen the angel of God face to face. But God reassured him, easy now. Don't panic. You won't die. Then Gideon built an altar there to God and named it, God's Peace. It's still called that at Ophrah of Abizer. That night this happened. God said to him, Take your father's best seven-year-old bull, the prime one. Tear down your father's ball altar and chop down the Eshira fertility pole beside it. Then build an altar to God, your God, on the top of this hill. Take the prime bull and present it as a whole burnt offering, using firewood from the Eshira pole that you cut down. Gideon selected ten men from his servants and did exactly what God had told him. But because of his family and the people in the neighborhood, he was afraid to do it openly, so he did it that night. Early in the morning, the people in town were shocked to find Baal's altar torn down, the Eshira pole beside it chopped down, and the prime bull burning away on the altar that had been built. They kept asking, who did this? Questions and more questions, and then the answer, Gideon son of Josh did it. The men of the town demanded of Josh, bring out your son. He must die. Why, he tore down the Baal altar and chopped down the Eshira tree. But Josh stood up to the crowd pressing in on him, are you going to fight Baal's battles for him? Are you going to save him? Anyone who takes Baal's side will be dead by morning. If Baal is a god in fact, let him fight his own battles and defend his own altar. They nicknamed Gideon that day Jeroboam because after he had torn down the Baal altar, he had said, let Baal fight his own battles. All the Midianites and Amalekites, the Easterners, got together, crossed the river, and made camp in the valley of Jezreel. God's Spirit came over Gideon. 
He blew his ram's horn trumpet and the Abiasrites came out, ready to follow him. He dispatched messengers all through Manasseh, calling them to the battle, also to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali. They all came. Gideon said to God, If this is right, if you are using me to save Israel as you've said, then look, I'm placing a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If dew is on the fleece only, but the floor is dry, then I know that you will use me to save Israel, as you said. That's what happened. When he got up early the next morning, he wrung out the fleece, enough dew to fill a bowl with water. Then Gideon said to God, Don't be impatient with me, but let me say one more thing. I want to try another time with the fleece. But this time let the fleece stay dry, while the dew drenches the ground. God made it happen that very night. Only the fleece was dry while the ground was wet with dew. Then the Ephraimite said to Gideon, Why did you leave us out of this, not calling us when you went to fight Midian? They were indignant and let him know it. But Gideon replied, What have I done compared to you? Why, even the gleanings of Ephraim are superior to the vintage of Abizar. God gave you Midian's commanders, Oreb and Zeb. What have I done compared with you? When they heard this, they calmed down and cooled off. Gideon and his three hundred arrived at the Jordan and crossed over. They were bone-tired but still pressing the pursuit. He asked the men of Sukkot, Please, give me some loaves of bread for my troops I have with me. They're worn out, and I'm hot on the trail of Zeba and Zalmunna, the Midianite kings. But the leaders in Sukkot said, You're on a wild goose chase, why should we help you on a fool's errand? Gideon said, If you say so. But when God gives me Zeba and Zalmunna, I'll give you a thrashing, whip your bare flesh with desert thorns and thistles. He went from there to Peniel and made the same request. The men of Peniel, like the men of Sukkot, also refused. Gideon told them, when I return safe and sound, I'll demolish this tower. Zeba and Zalmunna were in Karkar with an army of about fifteen companies, all that was left of the fighting force of the Easterners, they had lost one hundred and twenty companies of soldiers. Gideon went up the caravan trail east of Noba and Jogbiha, found and attacked the undefended camp. Zeba and Zalmunna fled, but he chased and captured the two kings of Midian. The whole camp had panicked. Gideon son of Josh returned from the battle by way of the Heres Pass. He captured a young man from Sukkot and asked some questions. The young man wrote down the names of the officials and leaders of Sukkot, seventy-seven men. Then Gideon went to the men of Sukkot and said, Here are the wild geese, Zeba and Zalmunna, you said I'd never catch. You wouldn't give so much as a scrap of bread to my worn-out men, you taunted us, saying that we were on a fool's errand. Then he took the seventy-seven leaders of Sukkot and thrashed them with desert thorns and thistles. And he demolished the tower of Peniel and killed the men of the city. He then addressed Zeba and Zalmanna, Tell me about the men you killed at Tabor. They were men much like you, they said, each one like a king's son. Gideon said, They were my brothers, my mother's sons. As God lives, if you had let them live, I would let you live. Then he spoke to Jether, his firstborn, Get up and kill them. But he couldn't do it, couldn't draw his sword. He was afraid, he was still just a boy. Zeba and Zalmunna said, Do it yourself if you're man enough. And Gideon did it. He stepped up and killed Zeba and Zalmunna. Then he took the crescents that hung on the necks of their camels. The Israelites said, Rule over us, you and your son and your grandson. You have saved us from Midian's tyranny. 
Gideon said, I most certainly will not rule over you, nor will my son. God will reign over you. Then Gideon said, But I do have one request. Give me, each of you, an earring that you took as plunder. Ishmaelites wore gold earrings, and the men all had their pockets full of them. They said, Of course. They're yours. They spread out a blanket and each man threw his plundered earrings on it. The gold earrings that Gideon had asked for weighed about 43 pounds, and that didn't include the crescents and pendants, the purple robes worn by the Midianite kings, and the ornaments hung around the necks of their camels. Gideon made the gold into a sacred ephod and put it on display in his hometown, Ophir. All Israel prostituted itself there. Gideon and his family, too, were seduced by it. Midian's tyranny was broken by the Israelites, nothing more was heard from them. The land was quiet for forty years in Gideon's time. Jeroboam son of Josh went home and lived in his house. Gideon had seventy sons. He fathered them all, he had a lot of wives. His concubine, the one at Shechem, also bore him a son. He named him Abimelech. Gideon son of Josh died at a good old age. He was buried in the tomb of his father Josh at Ophra of the Abiasrites. Gideon was hardly cool in the tomb when the people of Israel had gotten off track and were prostituting themselves to Baal, they made Baal of the covenant their god. The people of Israel forgot all about God, their God, who had saved them from all their enemies who had hemmed them in. And they didn't keep faith with the family of Jeroboam, Gideon, honoring all the good he had done for Israel. Abimelech son of Jeroboam went to Shechem to his uncles and all his mother's relatives and said to them, Ask all the leading men of Shechem, what do you think is best, that seventy men rule you, all those sons of Jeroboam, or that one man rule? You'll remember that I am your own flesh and blood. His mother's relatives reported the proposal to the leaders of Shechem. They were inclined to take Abimelech. Because, they said, he is, after all, one of us. They gave him seventy silver pieces from the shrine of Baal of the Covenant. With the money he hired some reckless riffraff soldiers and they followed along after him. He went to his father's house in Ophra and killed his half-brothers, the sons of Jeroboam, seventy men. And on one stone. The youngest, Jotham son of Jeroboam, managed to hide, the only survivor. Then all the leaders of Shechem and Beth Milo gathered at the oak by the standing stone at Shechem and crowned Abimelech king. When this was all told to Jotham, he climbed to the top of Mount Gerizim, raised his voice, and shouted, Listen to me, leaders of Shechem. And let God listen to you. The trees set out one day to anoint a king for themselves. They said to Olive Tree, Rule over us. But Olive Tree told them, Am I no longer good for making oil? That gives glory to gods and men. And to be demoted to waving over trees. The trees then said to Fig Tree. You come and rule over us. But Fig Tree said to them. Am I no longer good for making sweets? My mouth watering sweet fruits. And to be demoted to waving over trees. The trees then said to Vine. You come and rule over us. But Vine said to them, Am I no longer good for making wine? Wine that cheers gods and men. And to be demoted to waving over trees. All the trees then said to Tumbleweed, You come and reign over us. But Tumbleweed said to the trees, If you're serious about making me your king, Come and find shelter in my shade. 
But if not, let fire shoot from tumbleweed. And burn down the cedars of Lebanon. Now listen, do you think you did a right and honorable thing when you made Abimelech king? Do you think you treated Jeroboam and his family well, did for him what he deserved? My father fought for you, risked his own life, and rescued you from Midian's tyranny, and you have, just now, betrayed him. You massacred his sons, seventy men on a single stone. You made Abimelech, the son by his maidservant, king over Shechem's leaders because he's your relative. If you think that this is an honest day's work, this way you have treated Jeroboam today, then enjoy Abimelech and let him enjoy you. But if not, let fire break from Abimelech and burn up the leaders of Shechem and Beth Milo. And let fire break from the leaders of Shechem and Beth Milo and burn up Abimelech. And Jotham fled. He ran for his life. He went to Beer and settled down there, because he was afraid of his brother Abimelech. Abimelech ruled over Israel for three years. Then God brought bad blood between Abimelech and Shechem's leaders, who now work treacherously behind his back. Violence boomeranged, the murderous violence that killed the seventy brothers, the sons of Jeroboam, was now loose among Abimelech and Shechem's leaders, who had supported the violence. To undermine Abimelech, Shechem's leaders put men in ambush on the mountain passes who robbed travelers on those roads. And Abimelech was told. At that time Gaul's son of Ebed arrived with his relatives and moved into Shechem. The leaders of Shechem trusted him. One day they went out into the fields, gathered grapes in the vineyards, and trod them in the winepress. Then they held a celebration in their god's temple, a feast, eating and drinking. And then they started putting down Abimelech. Gaul son of Ebed said, Who is this Abimelech? And who are we Shechemites to take orders from him? Isn't he the son of Jeroboam, and isn't this his henchman Zebul? We belong to the race of Hammer and bear the noble name of Shechem. Why should we be toadies of Abimelech? If I were in charge of this people, the first thing I'd do is get rid of Abimelech. I'd say, show me your stuff, Abimelech, let's see who's boss here. Zebul, governor of the city, heard what Gaul's son of Ebed was saying and got angry. Secretly he sent messengers to Abimelech with the message, Gaul's son of Ebed and his relatives have come to Shechem and are stirring up trouble against you. Here's what you do, tonight bring your troops and wait in ambush in the field. In the morning, as soon as the sun breaks, get moving and charge the city. Gaul and his troops will come out to you, and you'll know what to do next. Abimelech and his troops, for companies of them, went up that night and waited in ambush approaching Shechem. Gaul's son of Ebed had gotten up and was standing in the city gate. Abimelech and his troops left their cover. When Gaul saw them he said to Zebul, Look at that, people coming down from the tops of the mountains. Zebul said, That's nothing but mountain shadows, they just look like men. Gaul kept chattering away. Then he said again, Look at the troops coming down off Tabarerez, the navel of the world, and one company coming straight from the Oracle Oak. Zebul said, Where is that big mouth of yours now? You who said, And who is Abimelech that we should take orders from him? Well, there he is with the troops you ridiculed. Here's your chance. Fight away. Gaul went out, backed by the leaders of Shechem, and did battle with Abimelech. Abimelech chased him, and Gaul turned tail and ran. Many fell wounded, right up to the city gate. Abimelech set up his field headquarters at Aroma while Zebul kept Gaul and his relatives out of Shechem. The next day the people went out to the fields. This was reported to Abimelech. 
He took his troops, divided them into three companies, and placed them in ambush in the fields. When he saw that the people were well out in the open, he sprang up and attacked them. Abimelech and the company with him charged ahead and took control of the entrance to the city gate, the other two companies chased down those who were in the open fields and killed them. Abimelech fought at the city all that day. He captured the city and massacred everyone in it. He leveled the city to the ground, then sowed it with salt. When the leaders connected with Shechem's tower heard this, they went into the fortified God of the Covenant Temple. This was reported to Abimelech that the Shechem's tower bunch were gathered together. He and his troops climbed Mount Zalman, Dark Mountain. Abimelech took his axe and chopped a bundle of firewood, picked it up, and put it on his shoulder. He said to his troops, Do what you've seen me do, and quickly. So each of his men cut his own bundle. They followed Abimelech, piled their bundles against the tower fortifications, and set the whole structure on fire. Everyone in Shechem's tower died, about a thousand men and women. Abimelech went on to Thebes. He camped at Thebes and captured it. The Tower of Strength stood in the middle of the city, all the men and women of the city along with the city's leaders had fled there and locked themselves in. They were up on the tower roof. Abimelech got as far as the tower and assaulted it. He came up to the tower door to set it on fire. Just then some woman dropped an upper millstone on his head and crushed his skull. He called urgently to his young armor-bearer and said, Draw your sword and kill me so they can't say of me, a woman killed him. His armor-bearer drove in his sword, and Abimelech died. When the Israelites saw that Abimelech was dead, they went home. God avenged the evil Abimelech had done to his father, murdering his seventy brothers. And God brought down on the heads of the men of Shechem all the evil that they had done, the curse of Jotham son of Jeroboam. Zebul, governor of the city, heard what Gaul son of Ebed was saying and got angry. Secretly he sent messengers to Abimelech with the message, Gaul son of Ebed and his relatives have come to Shechem and are stirring up trouble against you. Here's what you do, tonight bring your troops and wait in ambush in the field. In the morning, as soon as the sun breaks, get moving and charge the city. Gaul and his troops will come out to you, and you'll know what to do next. Abimelech and his troops, for companies of them, went up that night and waited in ambush approaching Shechem. Gaul's son of Ebed had gotten up and was standing in the city gate. Abimelech and his troops left their cover. When Gaul saw them he said to Zebul, Look at that, people coming down from the tops of the mountains. Zebul said, that's nothing but mountain shadows, they just look like men. Gaul kept chattering away. Then he said again, look at the troops coming down off Tabarerez, the navel of the world, and one company coming straight from the Oracle Oak. Zebul said, where is that big mouth of yours now? You who said, and who is Abimelech that we should take orders from him? Well, there he is with the troops you ridiculed. Here's your chance. Fight away. Gaul went out, backed by the leaders of Shechem, and did battle with Abimelech. Abimelech chased him, and Gaul turned tail and ran. Many fell wounded, right up to the city gate. Abimelech set up his field headquarters at Aroma while Zebul kept Gaul and his relatives out of Shechem. The next day the people went out to the fields. This was reported to Abimelech. He took his troops, divided them into three companies, and placed them in ambush in the fields. When he saw that the people were well out in the open, he sprang up and attacked them. Abimelech and the company with him charged ahead and took control of the entrance to the city gate, 
the other two companies chased down those who were in the open fields and killed them. Abimelech fought at the city all that day. He captured the city and massacred everyone in it. He leveled the city to the ground, then sowed it with salt. When the leaders connected with Shechem's tower heard this, they went into the fortified God of the Covenant Temple. This was reported to Abimelech that the Shechem's tower bunch were gathered together. He and his troops climbed Mount Zalman, Dark Mountain. Abimelech took his axe and chopped a bundle of firewood, picked it up, and put it on his shoulder. He said to his troops, Do what you've seen me do, and quickly. So each of his men cut his own bundle. They followed Abimelech, piled their bundles against the tower fortifications, and set the whole structure on fire. Everyone in Shechem's tower died, about a thousand men and women. Abimelech went on to Thebes. He camped at Thebes and captured it. The Tower of Strength stood in the middle of the city, all the men and women of the city along with the city's leaders had fled there and locked themselves in. They were up on the tower roof. Abimelech got as far as the tower and assaulted it. He came up to the tower door to set it on fire. Just then some woman dropped an upper millstone on his head and crushed his skull. He called urgently to his young armor-bearer and said, Draw your sword and kill me so they can't say of me, a woman killed him. His armor-bearer drove in his sword, and Abimelech died. When the Israelites saw that Abimelech was dead, they went home. God avenged the evil Abimelech had done to his father, murdering his seventy brothers. And God brought down on the heads of the men of Shechem all the evil that they had done, the curse of Jotham son of Jeroboam. Jephthah the Gileadite was one tough warrior. He was the son of a prostitute, but Gilead was his father. Meanwhile Gilead's legal wife had given him other sons, and when they grew up, his wife's sons threw Jephthah out. They told him, you're not getting any of our family inheritance, you're the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and went to live in the land of Tob. Some riffraff joined him and went around with him. Some time passed. And then the Ammonites started fighting Israel. With the Ammonites at war with them, the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. They said to Jephthah, Come. Be our general and we'll fight the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, But you hate me. You kicked me out of my family home. So why are you coming to me now? Because you are in trouble. Right? The elders of Gilead replied, That's it exactly. We've come to you to get you to go with us and fight the Ammonites. You'll be the head of all of us, all the Gileadites. Jephthah addressed the elders of Gilead, So if you bring me back home to fight the Ammonites and God gives them to me, I'll be your head, is that right? They said, God is witness between us, whatever you say, we'll do. Jephthah went along with the elders of Gilead. The people made him their top man and general. And Jephthah repeated what he had said before God at Mizpah. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites with a message, What's going on here that you have come into my country picking a fight? The king of the Ammonites told Jephthah's messengers, Because Israel took my land when they came up out of Egypt, from the Arnon all the way to the Jabbok and to the Jordan. Give it back peaceably and I'll go. Jephthah again sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites with the message, Jephthah's word, Israel took no Moabite land and no Ammonite land. When they came up from Egypt, Israel went through the desert as far as the Red Sea, arriving at Kadesh. There Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom saying, Let us pass through your land, please. 
but the king of Edom wouldn't let them. Israel also requested permission from the king of Moab, but he wouldn't let them cross either. They were stopped in their tracks at Kadesh. So they traveled across the desert and circled around the lands of Edom and Moab. They came out east of the land of Moab and set camp on the other side of the Arnon, they didn't set foot in Moabite territory, for Arnon was the Moabite border. Israel then sent messengers to Sion king of the Amorites at Heshbon the capital. Israel asked, Let us pass, please, through your land on the way to our country. But Sion didn't trust Israel to cut across his land, he got his entire army together, set up camp at Jahaz, and fought Israel. But God, the God of Israel, gave Sion and all his troops to Israel. Israel defeated them. Israel took all the Amorite land, all Amorite land from Arnon to the Jabbok and from the desert to the Jordan. It was God, the God of Israel, who pushed out the Amorites in favor of Israel, so who do you think you are to try to take it over? Why don't you just be satisfied with what your God Chemosh gives you and we'll settle for what God, our God, gives us? Do you think you're going to come off better than Balak son of Zippir, the king of Moab? Did he get anywhere in opposing Israel? Did he risk war? All this time, it's been 300 years now, that Israel has lived in Heshbon and its villages, in Aroer and its villages, and in all the towns along the Arnon, why didn't you try to snatch them away then? No, I haven't wronged you. But this is an evil thing that you are doing to me by starting a fight. Today God the judge will decide between the people of Israel and the people of Ammon. But the king of the Ammonites refused to listen to a word that Jephthah had sent him. God's spirit came upon Jephthah. He went across Gilead and Manasseh, went through Mizpah of Gilead, and from there approached the Ammonites. Jephthah made a vow before God, If you give me a clear victory over the Ammonites, then I'll give to God whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in one piece from among the Ammonites, I'll offer it up in a sacrificial burnt offering. Then Jephthah was off to fight the Ammonites. And God gave them to him. He beat them soundly, all the way from Aroer to the area around Minith as far as Abel Karaman, twenty cities. A Massacre Ammonites brought to their knees by the people of Israel. Jephthah came home to Mizpah. His daughter ran from the house to welcome him home, dancing to tambourines. She was his only child. He had no son or daughter except her. When he realized who it was, he ripped his clothes, saying, Ah, dearest daughter, I'm dirt. I'm despicable. My heart is torn to shreds. I made a vow to God and I can't take it back. She said, Dear father, if you made a vow to God, do to me what you vowed, God did his part and saved you from your Ammonite enemies. And then she said to her father, But let this one thing be done for me. Give me two months to wander through the hills and lament my virginity since I will never marry, I and my dear friends. Oh yes, go, he said. He sent her off for two months. She and her dear girlfriends went among the hills, lamenting that she would never marry. At the end of the two months, she came back to her father. He fulfilled the vow with her that he had made. She had never slept with a man. It became a custom in Israel that for four days every year the young women of Israel went out to mourn for the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite. The men of Ephraim mustered their troops, crossed to Zaphon, and said to Jephthah, Why did you go out to fight the Ammonites without letting us go with you? We're going to burn your house down on you. Jephthah said, I and my people had our hands full negotiating with the Ammonites. 
And I did call to you for help but you ignored me. When I saw that you weren't coming, I took my life in my hands and confronted the Ammonites myself. And God gave them to me. So why did you show up here today? Are you spoiling for a fight with me? So Jephthah got his Gilead troops together and fought Ephraim. And the men of Gilead hit them hard because they were saying, Gileadites are nothing but half-breeds and rejects from Ephraim and Manasseh. Gilead captured the fords of the Jordan at the crossing to Ephraim. If an Ephraimite fugitive said, Let me cross, the men of Gilead would ask, Are you an Ephraimite? And he would say, No, and they would say, Say, Shibboleth. But he would always say, Sibboleth, he couldn't say it right. Then they would grab him and kill him there at the fords of the Jordan. Forty-two Ephraimite divisions were killed on that occasion. Jephthah judged Israel six years. Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in his city, Mizpah of Gilead. After him, Ibsen of Bethlehem judged Israel. He had thirty sons and thirty daughters. He gave his daughters in marriage outside his clan and brought in thirty daughters-in-law from the outside for his sons. He judged Israel seven years. Ibsen died and was buried in Bethlehem. After him, Elon the Zebulonite judged Israel. He judged Israel ten years. Elon the Zebulonite died and was buried at Ijalan in the land of Zebulun. After him, Abdon son of Hillel the Pirathonite judged Israel. He had forty sons and thirty grandsons who rode on seventy donkeys. He judged Israel eight years. Abdon son of Hillel the Pirathonite died and was buried at Pirathon in the land of Ephraim in the Amalekite hill country. And then the people of Israel were back at it again, doing what was evil in God's sight. God put them under the domination of the Philistines for forty years. At that time there was a man named Manoah from Zorah from the tribe of Dan. His wife was barren and childless. The angel of God appeared to her and told her, I know that you are barren and childless, but you're going to become pregnant and bear a son. But take much care, drink no wine or beer, eat nothing ritually unclean. You are, in fact, pregnant right now, carrying a son. No razor will touch his head, the boy will be God's Nazarite from the moment of his birth. He will launch the deliverance from Philistine oppression. The woman went to her husband and said, A man of God came to me. He looked like the angel of God, terror laced with glory. I didn't ask him where he was from and he didn't tell me his name, but he told me, you're pregnant. You're going to give birth to a son. Don't drink any wine or beer and eat nothing ritually unclean. The boy will be God's Nazarite from the moment of birth to the day of his death. Manoah prayed to God, Master, let the man of God you sent come to us again and teach us how to raise this boy who is to be born. God listened to Manoah. God's angel came again to the woman. She was sitting in the field, her husband Manoah wasn't there with her. She jumped to her feet and ran and told her husband, He's back. The man who came to me that day. Manoah got up and, following his wife, came to the man. He said to him, Are you the man who spoke to my wife? He said, I am. Manoah said, So. When what you say comes true, what do you have to tell us about this boy and his work? The angel of God said to Manoah, Keep in mind everything I told the woman. Eat nothing that comes from the vine, drink no wine or beer, eat no ritually unclean foods. She's to observe everything I commanded her. Manoah said to the angel of God, Please, stay with us a little longer, we'll prepare a meal for you, a young goat. 
God's angel said to Manoah, Even if I stay, I won't eat your food. But if you want to prepare a whole burnt offering for God, go ahead, offer it. Manoah had no idea that he was talking to the angel of God. Then Manoah asked the angel of God, What's your name? When your words come true, we'd like to honor you. The angel of God said, What's this? You ask for my name. You wouldn't understand, it's sheer wonder. So Manoah took the kid and the grain offering and sacrificed them on a rock altar to God who works wonders. As the flames leapt up from the altar to heaven, God's angel also ascended in the altar flames. When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell face down to the ground. Manoah and his wife never saw the angel of God again. Only then did Manoah realize that this was God's angel. He said to his wife, We're as good as dead. We've looked on God. But his wife said, If God were planning to kill us, he wouldn't have accepted our whole burnt offering and grain offering, or revealed all these things to us, given us this birth announcement. The woman gave birth to a son. They named him Samson. The boy grew and God blessed him. The Spirit of God began working in him while he was staying at a Danite camp between Zorah and Eshtael. Samson went down to Timnah. There in Timnah a woman caught his eye, a Philistine girl. He came back and told his father and mother, I saw a woman in Timnah, a Philistine girl, get her for me as my wife. His parents said to him, Isn't there a woman among the girls in the neighborhood of our people? Do you have to go get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me. She's the one I want, she's the right one. His father and mother had no idea that God was behind this, that he was arranging an opportunity against the Philistines. At the time the Philistines lorded it over Israel. Minus six Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother. When he got to the vineyards of Timnah, a young lion came at him, roaring. The Spirit of God came on him powerfully and he ripped it open barehanded, like tearing a young goat. But he didn't tell his parents what he had done. Then he went on down and spoke to the woman. In Samson's eyes, she was the one. Some days later when he came back to get her, he made a little detour to look at what was left of the lion. And there a wonder, a swarm of bees in the lion's carcass, and honey. He scooped it up in his hands and kept going, eating as he went. He rejoined his father and mother and gave some to them and they ate. But he didn't tell them that he had scooped out the honey from the lion's carcass. His father went on down to make arrangements with the woman, while Samson prepared a feast there. That's what the young men did in those days. Because the people were wary of him, they arranged for thirty friends to mingle with him. Samson said to them, Let me put a riddle to you. If you can figure it out during the seven days of the feast, I'll give you thirty linen garments and thirty changes of fine clothing. But if you can't figure it out then you'll give me thirty linen garments and thirty changes of fine clothing. They said, Put your riddle. Let's hear it. So he said, From the eater came something to eat. From the strong came something sweet. Minus fifteen they couldn't figure it out. After three days they were still stumped. On the fourth day they said to Samson's bride, Worm the answer out of your husband or we'll burn you and your father's household. Have you invited us here to bankrupt us? So Samson's bride turned on the tears, saying to him, You hate me. You don't love me. You've told a riddle to my people but you won't even tell me the answer. He said, I haven't told my own parents, why would I tell you? 
but she turned on the tears all the seven days of the feast. On the seventh day, worn out by her nagging, he told her. Then she went and told it to her people. The men of the town came to him on the seventh day, just before sunset and said, What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? And Samson said, If you hadn't plowed with my heifer, you wouldn't have found out my riddle. Then the Spirit of God came powerfully on him. He went down to Ashkelon and killed thirty of their men, stripped them, and gave their clothing to those who had solved the riddle. Stalking out, smoking with anger, he went home to his father's house. Samson's bride became the wife of the best man at his wedding. Later on, it was during the wheat harvest, Samson visited his bride, bringing a young goat. He said, Let me see my wife, show me her bedroom. But her father wouldn't let him in. He said, I concluded that by now you hated her with a passion, so I gave her to your best man. But her little sister is even more beautiful. Why not take her instead? Samson said, That does it. This time when I wreak havoc on the Philistines, I'm blameless. Samson then went out and caught three hundred jackals. He lashed the jackals' tails together in pairs and tied a torch between each pair of tails. He then set fire to the torches and let them loose in the Philistine fields of ripe grain. Everything burned, both stacked and standing grain, vineyards and olive orchards, everything. The Philistines said, Who did this? They were told, Samson, son-in-law of the Timnite who took his bride and gave her to his best man. The Philistines went up and burned both her and her father to death. Samson then said, If this is the way you're going to act, I swear I'll get even with you. And I'm not quitting till the job's done. With that he tore into them, ripping them limb from limb, a huge slaughter. Then he went down and stayed in a cave at Etam Rock. The Philistines set out and made camp in Judah, preparing to attack Lehi, Jawbone. When the men of Judah asked, Why have you come up against us? They said, We're out to get Samson. We're going after Samson to do to him what he did to us. Three companies of men from Judah went down to the cave at Etam Rock and said to Samson, Don't you realize that the Philistines already bully and lord it over us? So what's going on with you, making things even worse? He said, It was tit for tat. I only did to them what they did to me. They said, Well, we've come down here to tie you up and turn you over to the Philistines. Samson said, Just promise not to hurt me. We promise, they said. We will tie you up and surrender you to them but, believe us, we won't kill you. They proceeded to tie him with new ropes and led him up from the rock. As he approached Lehi, the Philistines came to meet him, shouting in triumph. And then the Spirit of God came on him with great power. The ropes on his arms fell apart like flax on fire, the strips of leather slipped off his hands. He spotted a fresh donkey jawbone, reached down and grabbed it, and with it killed the whole company. And Samson said, with a donkey's jawbone. I made heaps of donkeys of them. With a donkey's jawbone. I killed an entire company. When he finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone. He named that place Ramath Lehi, Jawbone Hill. Now he was suddenly very thirsty. He called out to God, You have given your servant this great victory. Are you going to abandon me to die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? So God split open the rock basin in Lehi, water gushed out and Samson drank. His spirit revived, he was alive again. That's why it's called En Hakor, Caller Spring. 
It's still there at Lehi today. Samson judged Israel for twenty years in the days of the Philistines. Samson went to Gaza and saw a prostitute. He went to her. The news got around, Samson's here. They gathered around in hiding, waiting all night for him at the city gate, quiet as mice, thinking, at sunrise we'll kill him. Samson was in bed with the woman until midnight. Then he got up, seized the doors of the city gate and the two gateposts, bolts and all, hefted them on his shoulder, and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Some time later he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, grapes. Her name was Delilah. The Philistine tyrants approached her and said, Seduce him. Discover what's behind his great strength and how we can tie him up and humble him. Each man's company will give you a hundred shekels of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, dear, the secret of your great strength, and how you can be tied up and humbled. Samson told her, If they were to tie me up with seven bowstrings, the kind made from fresh animal tendons, not dried out, then I would become weak, just like anyone else. The Philistine tyrants brought her seven bowstrings, not dried out, and she tied him up with them. The men were waiting in ambush in her room. Then she said, The Philistines are on you, Samson. He snapped the cords as though they were mere threads. The secret of his strength was still a secret. Delilah said, Come now, Samson, you're playing with me, making up stories. Be serious, tell me how you can be tied up. He told her, if you were to tie me up tight with new ropes, ropes never used for work, then I would be helpless, just like anybody else. So Delilah got some new ropes and tied him up. She said, the Philistines are on you, Samson. The men were hidden in the next room. He snapped the ropes from his arms like threads. Delilah said to Samson, you're still playing games with me, teasing me with lies. Tell me how you can be tied up. He said to her, if you wove the seven braids of my hair into the fabric on the loom and drew it tight, then I would be as helpless as any other mortal. When she had him fast asleep, Delilah took the seven braids of his hair and wove them into the fabric on the loom and drew it tight. Then she said, The Philistines are on you, Samson. He woke from his sleep and ripped loose from both the loom and fabric. She said, How can you say, I love you, when you won't even trust me? Three times now you've toyed with me, like a cat with a mouse, refusing to tell me the secret of your great strength. She kept at it day after day, nagging and tormenting him. Finally, he was fed up, he couldn't take another minute of it. He spilled it that he told her, a razor has never touched my head. I've been God's Nazarite from conception. If I were shaved, my strength would leave me, I would be as helpless as any other mortal. When Delilah realized that he had told her his secret, she sent for the Philistine tyrants, telling them, Come quickly, this time he's told me the truth. They came, bringing the bribe money. When she got him to sleep, his head on her lap, she motioned to a man to cut off the seven braids of his hair. Immediately he began to grow weak. His strength drained from him. Then she said, The Philistines are on you, Samson. He woke up, thinking, I'll go out, like always, and shake free. He didn't realize that God had abandoned him. The Philistines grabbed him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza. They shackled him in irons and put him to the work of grinding in the prison. But his hair, though cut off, began to grow again. The Philistine tyrants got together to offer a great sacrifice to their god Dagon. They celebrated, 
saying our God has given us. Samson our enemy, and when the people saw him, they joined in, cheering their God our God has given. Our enemy to us. The one who ravaged our country. Piling high the corpses among us. Then this, everyone was feeling high and someone said, Get Samson. Let him show us his stuff. They got Samson from the prison and he put on a show for them, they had him standing between the pillars. Samson said to the young man who was acting as his guide, Put me where I can touch the pillars that hold up the temple so I can rest against them. The building was packed with men and women, including all the Philistine tyrants. And there were at least three thousand in the stands watching Samson's performance. And Samson cried out to God, Master, God. Oh, please, look on me again. Oh, please, give strength yet once more, God. With one avenging blow let me be avenged. On the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson reached out to the two central pillars that held up the building and pushed against them, one with his right arm, the other with his left. Saying, Let me die with the Philistines, Samson pushed hard with all his might. The building crashed on the tyrants and all the people in it. He killed more people in his death than he had killed in his life. His brothers and all his relatives went down to get his body. They carried him back and buried him in the tomb of Manoah his father, between Zorah and Eshtael that he judged Israel for twenty years. Now a man named Micah from the hill country of Ephraim said to his mother, The eleven hundred shekels of silver that were taken from you and about which I heard you utter a curse I have that silver with me, I took it. Then his mother said, The Lord bless you, my son. When he returned the eleven hundred shekels of silver to his mother, she said, I solemnly consecrate my silver to the Lord for my son to make an image overlaid with silver. I will give it back to you. So after he returned the silver to his mother, she took two hundred shekels of silver and gave them to a silversmith, who used them to make the idol. And it was put in Micah's house. Now this man Micah had a shrine, and he made an ephod and some household gods and installed one of his sons as his priest. In those days Israel had no king, everyone did as they saw fit. A young Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, who had been living within the clan of Judah, left that town in search of some other place to stay. On his way he came to Micah's house in the hill country of Ephraim. Micah asked him, Where are you from? I'm a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, he said, and I'm looking for a place to stay. Then Micah said to him, Live with me and be my father and priest, and I'll give you ten shekels of silver a year, your clothes, and your food. So the Levite agreed to live with him, and the young man became like one of his sons to him. Then Micah installed the Levite, and the young man became his priest and lived in his house. And Micah said, Now I know that the Lord will be good to me, since this Levite has become my priest. In those days Israel had no king. And in those days the tribe of the Danites was seeking a place of their own where they might settle, because they had not yet come into an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. So the Danites sent five of their leading men from Zorah and Eshtael to spy out the land and explore it. These men represented all the Danites. They told them, go, explore the land. So they entered the hill country of Ephraim and came to the house of Micah, where they spent the night. When they were near Micah's house, they recognized the voice of the young Levite, so they turned in there and asked him, Who brought you here? What are you doing in this place? Why are you here? He told them what Micah had done for him, and said, He has hired me, and I am his priest. Then they said to him, Please inquire of God to learn whether our journey will be successful. The priest answered them, Go in peace. Your journey has the Lord's approval. So the five men left and came to Lish, 
where they saw that the people were living in safety, like the Sidonians, at peace and secure. And since their land lacked nothing, they were prosperous. Also, they lived a long way from the Sidonians and had no relationship with anyone else. When they returned to Zora and Eshtail, their fellow Danitas asked them, how did you find things? They answered, come on, let's attack them. We have seen the land, and it is very good. Aren't you going to do something? Don't hesitate to go there and take it over. When you get there, you will find an unsuspecting people and a spacious land that God has put into your hands, a land that lacks nothing whatever. Then six hundred men of the Dani Tez, armed for battle, set out from Zora and Eshtail. On their way they set up camp near Kiriath Jerim in Judah. This is why the place west of Kiriath Jerim is called Mahana Dan to this day. From there they went on to the hill country of Ephraim and came to Micah's house. Then the five men who had spied out the land of Lysh said to their fellow Danites, Do you know that one of these houses has an ephod, some household gods, and an image overlaid with silver? Now you know what to do. Fifteen so they turned in there and went to the house of the young Levite at Micah's place and greeted him. The six hundred Danites, armed for battle, stood at the entrance of the gate. The five men who had spied out the land went inside and took the idol, the ephod, and the household gods while the priest and the six hundred armed men stood at the entrance of the gate. When the five men went into Micah's house and took the idol, the ephod, and the household gods, the priest said to them, What are you doing? They answered him, Be quiet. Don't say a word. Come with us, and be our father and priest. Isn't it better that you serve a tribe and clan in Israel as priest rather than just one man's household? The priest was very pleased. He took the ephod, the household gods and the idol and went along with the people. Putting their little children, their livestock and their possessions in front of them, they turned away and left. When they had gone some distance from Micah's house, the men who lived near Micah were called together and overtook the Danites. As they shouted after them, the Danites turned and said to Micah, What's the matter with you that you called out your men to fight? He replied, You took the gods I made, and my priest, and went away. What else do I have? How can you ask, What's the matter with you? The Danites answered, Don't argue with us, or some of the men may get angry and attack you and you and your family will lose your lives. So the Danites went their way, and Micah, seeing that they were too strong for him, turned around and went back home. Then they took what Micah had made, and his priest, and went on to Lysh, against a people at peace and secure. They attacked them with the sword and burned down their city. There was no one to rescue them because they lived a long way from Sidon and had no relationship with anyone else. The city was in a valley near Beth Rehob. The Danites rebuilt the city and settled there. They named it Dan after their ancestor Dan, who was born to Israel though the city used to be called Lysh. There the Danites set up for themselves the idol, and Jonathan son of Gershom, the son of Moses, and his sons were priests for the tribe of Dan until the time of the captivity of the land. They continued to use the idol Micah had made, all the time the house of God was in Shiloh. In those days Israel had no king. Now a Levite who lived in a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim took a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. But she was unfaithful to him. She left him and went back to her parents' home in Bethlehem, Judah. After she had been there four months, her husband went to her to persuade her to return. He had with him his servant and two donkeys. She took him into her parents' home, and when her father saw him, he gladly welcomed him. His father-in-law, the woman's father, prevailed on him to stay, so he remained with him three days, eating and drinking and sleeping there. On the fourth day they got up early and he prepared to leave, but the woman's father said to his son-in-law, Refresh yourself with something to eat, then you can go. 
So the two of them sat down to eat and drink together. Afterward the woman's father said, Please stay tonight and enjoy yourself. And when the man got up to go, his father-in-law persuaded him, so he stayed there that night. On the morning of the fifth day, when he rose to go, the woman's father said, Refresh yourself. Wait till afternoon. So the two of them ate together. Then when the man, with his concubine and his servant, got up to leave, his father-in-law, the woman's father, said, Now look, it's almost evening. Spend the night here, the day is nearly over. Stay and enjoy yourself. Early tomorrow morning you can get up and be on your way home. But, unwilling to stay another night, the man left and went toward Jebus, that is, Jerusalem, with his two saddled donkeys and his concubine. When they were near Jebus and the day was almost gone, the servant said to his master, Come, let's stop at this city of the Jebusites and spend the night. His master replied, No. We won't go into any city whose people are not Israelites. We will go on to Gibeah. He added, Come, let's try to reach Gibeah or Ramah and spend the night in one of those places. So they went on and the sun set as they neared Gibeah in Benjamin. There they stopped to spend the night. They went and sat in the city square, but no one took them in for the night. That evening an old man from the hill country of Ephraim, who was living in Gibeah, the inhabitants of the place were Benjamites, came in from his work in the fields. When he looked and saw the traveler in the city square, the old man asked, Where are you going? Where did you come from? He answered, We are on our way from Bethlehem in Judah to a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim where I live. I have been to Bethlehem in Judah and now I am going to the house of the Lord. No one has taken me in for the night. We have both straw and fodder for our donkeys and bread and wine for ourselves your servants me, the woman and the young man with us. We don't need anything. You are welcome at my house, the old man said. Let me supply whatever you need. Only don't spend the night in the square. So he took him into his house and fed his donkeys. After they had washed their feet, they had something to eat and drink. While they were enjoying themselves, some of the wicked men of the city surrounded the house. Pounding on the door, they shouted to the old man who owned the house, Bring out the man who came to your house so we can have sex with him. The owner of the house went outside and said to them, No, my friends, don't be so vile. Since this man is my guest, don't do this outrageous thing. Look, here is my virgin daughter and his concubine. I will bring them out to you now, and you can use them and do to them whatever you wish. But as for this man, don't do such an outrageous thing. But the men would not listen to him. So the man took his concubine and sent her outside to them, and they raped her and abused her throughout the night, and at dawn they let her go. At daybreak the woman went back to the house where her master was staying, fell down at the door and lay there until daylight. When her master got up in the morning and opened the door of the house and stepped out to continue on his way, there lay his concubine, fallen in the doorway of the house, with her hands on the threshold. He said to her, Get up, let's go. But there was no answer. Then the man put her on his donkey and set out for home. When he reached home, he took a knife and cut up his concubine, limb by limb, into twelve parts and sent them into all the areas of Israel. Everyone who saw it was saying to one another, Such a thing has never been seen or done not since the day the Israelites came up out of Egypt. Just imagine. We must do something. So speak up. Then all Israel from Dan to Beersheba and from the land of Gilead came together as one and assembled before the Lord in Mizpah. The leaders of all the people of the tribes of Israel took their places in the assembly of God's people, 400,000 men armed with swords. The Benjamites heard that the Israelites had gone up to Mizpah. Then the Israelites said, 
tell us how this awful thing happened. So the Levite, the husband of the murdered woman, said, I and my concubine came to Gibeah in Benjamin to spend the night. During the night the men of Gibeah came after me and surrounded the house, intending to kill me. They raped my concubine, and she died. I took my concubine, cut her into pieces and sent one piece to each region of Israel's inheritance, because they committed this lewd and outrageous act in Israel. Now, all you Israelites, speak up and tell me what you have decided to do. All the men rose up together as one, saying, None of us will go home. No, not one of us will return to his house. But now this is what we'll do to Gibeah, we'll go up against it in the order decided by casting lots. We'll take ten men out of every hundred from all the tribes of Israel, and a hundred from a thousand, and a thousand from ten thousand, to get provisions for the army. Then, when the army arrives at Gibeah and Benjamin, it can give them what they deserve for all this vileness done in Israel. So all the Israelites got together and united as one against the city. The tribes of Israel sent messengers throughout the tribe of Benjamin, saying, What about this awful crime that was committed among you? Now turn those wicked men of Gibeah over to us so that we may put them to death and purge the evil from Israel. But the Benjamites would not listen to their fellow Israelites. From their towns they came together at Gibeah to fight against the Israelites. At once the Benjamites mobilized 26,000 swordsmen from their towns, in addition to 700 able young men from those living in Gibeah. Among all these soldiers there were 700 select troops who were left-handed, each of whom could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. Israel, apart from Benjamin, mustered 400,000 swordsmen, all of them fit for battle. The Israelites went up to Bethel and inquired of God. They said, Who of us is to go up first to fight against the Benjamites? The Lord replied, Judah shall go first. The next morning the Israelites got up and pitched camp near Gibeah. Twenty the Israelites went out to fight the Benjamites and took up battle positions against them at Gibeah. The Benjamites came out of Gibeah and cut down 22,000 Israelites on the battlefield that day. But the Israelites encouraged one another and again took up their positions where they had stationed themselves the first day. The Israelites went up and wept before the Lord until evening, and they inquired of the Lord. They said, Shall we go up again to fight against the Benjamites, our fellow Israelites? The Lord answered, Go up against them. Then the Israelites drew near to Benjamin the second day. This time, when the Benjamites came out from Gibeah to oppose them, they cut down another 18,000 Israelites, all of them armed with swords. Then all the Israelites, the whole army, went up to Bethel, and there they sat weeping before the Lord. They fasted that day until evening and presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings to the Lord. And the Israelites inquired of the Lord. In those days the Ark of the Covenant of God was there, with Phinehas son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, ministering before it. They asked, Shall we go up again to fight against the Benjamites, our fellow Israelites, or not? The Lord responded, Go, for tomorrow I will give them into your hands. Then Israel set an ambush around Gibeah. They went up against the Benjamites on the third day and took up positions against Gibeah as they had done before. The Benjamites came out to meet them and were drawn away from the city. They began to inflict casualties on the Israelites as before, so that about thirty men fell in the open field and on the roads the one leading to Bethel and the other to Gibeah. While the Benjamites were saying, We are defeating them as before, the Israelites were saying, Let's retreat and draw them away from the city to the roads. All the men of Israel moved from their places and took up positions at Baal Tamar, and the Israelite ambush charged out of its place on the west of Gibeah. Then ten thousand of Israel's able young men made a frontal attack on Gibeah. 
The fighting was so heavy that the Benjamites did not realize how near disaster was. The Lord defeated Benjamin before Israel, and on that day the Israelites struck down 25,100 Benjamites, all armed with swords. Then the Benjamites saw that they were beaten. Now the men of Israel had given way before Benjamin, because they relied on the ambush they had set near Gibeah. Those who had been in ambush made a sudden dash into Gibeah, spread out and put the whole city to the sword. The Israelites had arranged with the ambush that they should send up a great cloud of smoke from the city. And then the Israelites would counterattack. The Benjamites had begun to inflict casualties on the Israelites, about thirty, and they said, We are defeating them as in the first battle. But when the column of smoke began to rise from the city, the Benjamites turned and saw the whole city going up in smoke. Then the Israelites counterattacked, and the Benjamites were terrified, because they realized that disaster had come on them. So they fled before the Israelites in the direction of the wilderness, but they could not escape the battle. And the Israelites who came out of the towns cut them down there. They surrounded the Benjamites, chased them and easily overran them in the vicinity of Gibeah on the east. Eighteen thousand Benjamites fell, all of them valiant fighters. As they turned and fled toward the wilderness to the Rock of Rimmon, the Israelites cut down five thousand men along the roads. They kept pressing after the Benjamites as far as Jittim and struck down two thousand more. On that day twenty-five thousand Benjamite swordsmen fell, all of them valiant fighters. But six hundred of them turned and fled into the wilderness to the Rock of Rimmon, where they stayed four months. The men of Israel went back to Benjamin and put all the towns to the sword, including the animals and everything else they found. All the towns they came across they set on fire. The men of Israel had taken an oath at Mizpah, not one of us will give his daughter in marriage to a Benjamite. The people went to Bethel, where they sat before God until evening, raising their voices and weeping bitterly. Lord, God of Israel, they cried, why has this happened to Israel? Why should one tribe be missing from Israel today? Early the next day the people built an altar and presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then the Israelites asked, who from all the tribes of Israel has failed to assemble before the Lord? For they had taken a solemn oath that anyone who failed to assemble before the Lord at Mizpah was to be put to death. Now the Israelites grieved for the tribe of Benjamin, their fellow Israelites. Today one tribe is cut off from Israel, they said. How can we provide wives for those who are left, since we have taken an oath by the Lord not to give them any of our daughters in marriage? Then they asked, which one of the tribes of Israel failed to assemble before the Lord at Mizpah? They discovered that no one from Jabesh Gilead had come to the camp for the assembly. For when they counted the people, they found that none of the people of Jabesh Gilead were there. So the assembly sent 12,000 fighting men with instructions to go to Jabesh Gilead and put to the sword those living there, including the women and children. This is what you are to do, they said. Kill every male and every woman who is not a virgin. They found among the people living in Jabesh Gilead 400 young women who had never slept with a man, and they took them to the camp at Shiloh in Canaan. Then the whole assembly sent an offer of peace to the Benjamites at the Rock of Rimmon. So the Benjamites returned at that time and were given the women of Jabesh Gilead who had been spared. But there were not enough for all of them. The people grieved for Benjamin because the Lord had made a gap in the tribes of Israel. And the elders of the assembly said, With the women of Benjamin destroyed, how shall we provide wives for the men who are left? The Benjamite survivors must have heirs, they said, so that a tribe of Israel will not be wiped out. We can't give them our daughters as wives, since we Israelites have taken this oath, cursed be anyone who gives a wife to a Benjamite. But look, there is the annual festival of the Lord in Shiloh, which lies north of Bethel, 
east of the road that goes from Bethel to Shechem and south of Lebanon. So they instructed the Benjamites, saying, Go and hide in the vineyards. And watch. When the young women of Shiloh come out to join in the dancing, rush from the vineyards, and each of you sees one of them to be your wife. Then return to the land of Benjamin. When their fathers or brothers complain to us, we will say to them, Do us the favor of helping them, because we did not get wives for them during the war. You will not be guilty of breaking your oath, because you did not give your daughters to them. So that is what the Benjamites did. While the young women were dancing, each man caught one and carried her off to be his wife. Then they returned to their inheritance and rebuilt the towns and settled in them. At that time the Israelites left that place and went home to their tribes and clans, each to his own inheritance. In those days Israel had no king, everyone did as they saw fit.